the 2006 address at Regensburg by Pope Benedict XVI, not the current pontiff, his predecessor, the theologian, the shy theologian, Benedict XVI. The Pope, again, this takes a little moment or two to set up, but I'm just set it up and then I get out of the way and let's see what you do with it. He makes a couple of assertions. The first concerns the reasonableness of religious belief. And he quotes an exchange between a 14th century Byzantine emperor and his Muslim captors in which the emperor tells them they're wrong to impose religion by force. Benedict XVI, in the speech, he asks, is the conviction that acting unreasonably contradicts God's nature merely a Greek idea, or is it always and intrinsically true? Modifying the first book of Genesis, the first book of the whole Bible, John, the Apostle John, begins the prologue of his gospel with the words, in the beginning was the Logos. John thus spoke the final word on the biblical concept of God, and in this word all the often tortuous threads of biblical faith find their culmination and synthesis." Close quote. All right, huge amount there, but the fundamental idea is that properly understood, faith is reasonable. It's not merely the idea of the reasonableness of faith is not merely a cultural construct that belongs in one place or one time. It is intrinsically, faith is intrinsically reasonable. The Enlightenment got that wrong. And we, we need somehow or other to, reunite, to, to grasp the reasonableness of the first questions that will enable us to ask them once again. Right? Well, this is, you know, there's a lot that we'll, one can unpack I'm just going to shut up. This. I'll let you take there's it There's a lot there. that we can unpack in all of this. Uh, I, I would say that... It's fun though, isn't it? It's, this is, wow, this is like, this is a harder interview than I was expecting, Peter. <laughs> Way harder than I was expecting. Uh, I think that, uh, I think it is a little bit tricky to say both that it's, you don't want faith to be unreasonable, you don't want it to be merely reasonable, because right, then you could just right. use reason. <laughs> and so it's always a little bit of a complicated question of how, how you get uh, faith, faith and, and reason to, to work together. The, um, I'm, I'm naturally quite sympathetic to, um, to the Benedict um, position, position right, right. Uh, and approach in a lot of ways. And yet, um, the, um, the, from a literary point of view, what was so int fascinating about reading the Regensburg Address, where it was, you know, he was maybe uh, using this 14th century Byzantine emperor maybe as a mouthpiece for, for the, the pro-reason thing. We know what happened to the Byzantine Empire. It sort of fell apart shortly thereafter. Short, very shortly and, thereafter. Uh, and the suspicion one has is maybe um, the Byzantine emperor in the 14th century should not just have been making reasoned arguments, but should have also been getting some weapons and protecting himself from um, um, what was, um, you know, the disaster that was about to, to befall the, the Byzantine Empire. And, uh, and then um, the, the, the thought I had in looking at the speech from the point of view of 2019 um, that I wonder about is, was there something about it that was somehow prophetic of something going wrong with sort of rationalist conservative Catholicism where, um, you know, Benedict is just like the 14th century um, Byzantine em emperor and maybe even though I'm pro-reason and I think we live in a society where people don't respect reason enough, he somehow believed in it too much. And, um, and, um, and then, uh, you know, my, I, I'm not, not Catholic like, like you and I, I've always, I always have a two-word rebuttal of Roman Catholicism to all my conservative Catholic friends. It's just uh, Pope Francis. And, um, okay. and, and there, were, there was something about... Uh, you get to say that now. If I start on those, I just add 10,000 years you just, to my you, time you, in you, purgatory. You, you can just have me back on your show. Yeah, exactly. You can do that. Okay, but, okay. But so that's, that's, that's the... So it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating speech, but, uh, so but you, it can be you, unpacked on all these levels. So I read the Re Regensburg Address <laughs> in your syllabus and I thought, ah, Peter's offering, here's the way out of the impasse. And you're saying, no, not exactly. I take that as a warning. To place too much faith, place too much faith in the reasonableness of faith or in reasonableness itself. And, and 10 years later, everything you stood for will be wiped out. Well, I think, look, I, th I, think, uh, I think we have to always try to go back to um, intellect, mind, rationality as, as core values. And there are, there are ways in which we've, we've uh, gone too far from them. But at the same time, I also think there's something to be said for it can't be just interiority. We also should be, you know, acting okay. in our world. We should be, uh, we should be, um, you know, we shouldn't be in the sort of yoga, meditative, 
psychological retreat, and uh, and that's the that's and then and then there are, and then there's sort of all these ways where science and technology, um, you know, that there were sort of the that there was such a big driver of, of progress for centuries. There's so many parts of these that uh, no longer feel positive to people, okay. and that uh, that feel like a retreat. I'll, I'll give a I'll give a Silicon Valley yeah. version of this. Uh, you know, I was I was involved in the early 2000s in a lot of the uh, futuristic AI initiatives. Um, you invested in uh, there's um, a Singularity Institute. There were sort of all these groups, and it was, right. the basic premise was you know AI is going to happen. It's going to be if, if it happens, it's this very important. AI, you, hold on. You better just for viewers, you better explain. Um, give a, give us a two sentence definition of AI. Yeah, it means all these different things. But the the context in which they used it was sort of the science fiction version of AI. So super duper smart computers that can do anything, and they're going to be very powerful. So smart and, they'll seem like humans, and or maybe even smarter than humans. Right. And it's very important whether or not they're friendly or unfriendly, and this was sort of an important problem that we needed to solve. And, and circa 2003, it felt like, okay, we don't know which way it's going to go, and uh, we need to, to work on it. And if you had to score it circa 2019, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's far more pessimistic. And people now believe they know what's going to happen at the singularity, that the AI is going to kill every human being on this planet. That's what people actually believe. And, Including um, you? Uh, well, I'm, I, I'm, we can be skeptical how fast it happens, you know, but, but no, that's the, that's the general zeitgeist, even in Silicon Valley, okay. even in right. Silicon Valley. Right, right, Certainly, right. anyone who watches a science fiction movie believes that. Right. And um, Your point is that this valley, then, which used to be bright and hopeful, has gone very dark. And so maybe if you're an AI researcher, you should be working on it very, very slowly, and you're going to be somewhat less motivated to work on it. And uh, it has a very different has a very different sort of a sort of a feel to it. And so even, even this sort of uh, fairly theoretical part of computer science that's more in the world of bits than the world of atoms has, um, has shifted into this much more apocalyptic direction where, you know, the, um, where, you know, 2003, 2004, it was, we need to move as fast as we can. And now it's, it's sort of like the precautionary principle and maybe, you know, we should be scared of our own shadow and just be, very, very slow, and that's happened even in, um, even in computer science, right. which was one of the healthier fields still 20 years ago.